13 years ago, four hijacked planes were crashed into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and into a field in Pennsylvania. Terrorism hit the American heartland. 13 years later, where are we today? Are we safer? Why can't the United States administration admit that we're at war with radical Islam? Dr. Daniel Pipes is a specialist on the Middle East and president of the Middle East Forum. He joins us now from Philadelphia. Dr. Pipes, welcome to the show on this uh, tragic anniversary. It's more than a tragedy, though, more than an atrocity. Why can't the Obama administration, any more than the Bush administration before it, say that we are at war with radical Islam? Why the euphemisms? Not just euphemism, Ezra, but even denial, mm -hmm. saying that uh, the organization that we're now at war with is not Islamic. That's really extraordinary. Uh, I think there are two main reasons, and it isn't so much political correctness and cowardice so, as it is these two reasons. One is the fear that to talk about Islam is to agitate Muslims and to make more Muslims antagonistic to us. There's no proof for it, but there is this worry. And secondly, and more profoundly, there is a feeling that if we were to talk about Islam, radical Islam, then we would have to change our whole way of life. That the easygoing, liberal ways we have would have to change, would become more like, say, Israel, with a very stringent security situation. And people don't want to do that. I think you're right. I want to go a little bit further, not just Israel in terms of security at every mall, at every bus, but change our life in one more way, that we, we can't pretend that we're all the same, that because we all drink Tim Horton's coffee together, that we share the same values, that we all listen to the same music, we share the same values. I think it's even more than just we don't want to change our lifestyle. We don't want to change our mindset, our utopian belief that we're all the same. We all like to go to McDonald's. We all like to uh, Mickey Mouse and Disneyland, and it's just different shades of skin tone or language. I think that's the greatest fear, the greatest inertia. All, what do you think of that? And I agree with you, and I go yet further than you and say that we all share the same values. Deep down, all of us are humanitarian, generous, liberal, and so forth, that we are good people deep down. And there's a reluctance to say, well, no, you know, whether it be Nazis in the 30s or communists in the 50s or... Islamists today, that there are some people and movements that are evil, that are barbaric, that have to be fought and destroyed. There's great reluctance. I mean, you saw it before World War II. There was a great reluctance. Only finally, when you had to confront it, when there was a severe danger, did Westerners, okay, come to terms. Uh, let me just mention Chamberlain and, and, and Churchill as a symbol of that transformation, reluctant transformation. Uh, as the Nazi menace grew and grew. And, and you're talking about tackling radical Islam when it comes to war. I think of Rotherham, the, the city in the UK where 1,400 girls were systematically groomed, raped, and prostituted. Uh, if we can't even stand up in a civilian setting against rape gangs because of this fear of acknowledging people are different and they may be break along religious lines. If we can't even do that in a domestic civilian setting, how on earth could we pro possibly talk, uh, tackle something all the more terrifying, a bomb, a suicide bomber, maybe even a, a nuclear bomber? I, I think it goes to our psychology and it's a form of vanity, really, I think. What, I, let's get back to uh, the president's speech yesterday where he, it, it's like that old skit on Saturday Night Live when Mike Myers played Linda Richmond in Coffee Talk and he'd say, Holy Roman Empire. It's not holy, it's not Roman, it's not the empire. Discuss. I, that's what I thought of when last night the president said the Islamic State. It's not Islamic and it's not a state. Let me discuss. I mean, he was trying, he was trying to change reality to fit his fantasy. But here's the problem. He's going to war based on his fantasy assessment of the world. Uh, he's not actually proposing a plan that would take on the Islamic State. I mean, he's not proposing any boots on the ground. He's proposing sort of a, a pinprick approach that might be suited to a terrorist group, but not to a proto-country. Or to put it differently, it might work and it might not. It's a prayer, a wing and a prayer. It's not a strategy for victory. Uh, I would agree on both your points that uh, it is Islamic and it is a state. Uh, they control a piece of territory about the size of Great Britain. They have, their major city has almost two million people. 
The capital has half a million people. Well, that sounds like a state to me. They've got ministries and they've got administrators, they've got dams, electricity, you name it. It's, it's a functioning state at this point. And it's of course Islamic. Everything they're doing is in the name of Islam. It's preposterous and lunatic to say that it's not Islamic. Yeah. They are utterly driven by their understanding of Islam. And there's no role for a non-Muslim politician, and by the way, both uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush did likewise, to get up and say, oh, that's not Islam. So is David Cameron in Britain. Uh, you know, you're, a, you're, you're in a very special place in Canada where you don't have uh, heads of government coming out and bleeding about what is Islam and what is not Islam. Yeah. They have no, no authority and it, it takes no a purpose. It takes a great... May I, may I go back? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, doctor. I, I was just going to say, could we go back to Rotherham for a second? Yeah. You mentioned in, in passing. I think it's very important. This, as you indicated, is this atrocity of 1,400 or so girls, and I think some boys, being um, sexually abused over a 16-year period. There are two things about it that are most upsetting. One is the police hid this. The police in Rotherham hid this, and indeed went after parents who were trying to raise the topic. And secondly, the media. You and I are discussing it now, but by and large, what should be an immense scandal that is discussed in every corner is basically unheard of. Most people will not have heard of Rotherham. I suggest R-O-T-H-E-R-H-A-M. Look it up. Read about it. It's an extraordinary and appalling story. Yeah, it, and it's, that's the police and the media. We see the same thing in the U.S. Armed Forces when uh, Nidal Hassan shot up Fort Hood shouting Allah Akbar. You know, that was called workplace violence by the Pentagon that scrubbed it of its ideology. I, if the military itself, if the, if the White House itself doesn't like to use the word terrorism, then, then we're in trouble if they can't even speak the name of evil, let alone deal with it. You know, we've got a problem, I think, in the West, and it has, I don't think it's gotten any better since 9-11, we refuse to listen to our enemies when they speak their plans. Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf quite plainly, and, and perhaps it would be proper to say that's outlandish or that's insane, but he said what he was going to do. Osama bin Laden said what he was going to do. Every Muslim terrorist group that has the word Islam in its name says what they're going to do. It's quite extraordinary that we would say, no, let us furnish an excuse for our enemies that they don't even ask for for themselves. Dr. Pipes, I'm afraid we're out of time, but it's great to talk to you, as always, especially on this anniversary where we need to think deeply about the problems and the risks ahead. Good to see you again.